Hey, this is Rene. Welcome back to another video on this channel. And today I'm back with another programming tutorial for you. I want to do more programming tutorials again now. So um, right in the beginning, I want to encourage you to just drop your recommendations for videos um, about programming in MetaTrader 5 in the comment section. I will have a look at them. And uh, if a lot of people want to see like the same topic, I will make a video about this. So um, I already asked for video recommendations in the last video and somebody told or somebody requested a trailing stop that trades at the swing highs and lows. So for example, if we are in a buy trend and we currently have a open buy position, um, I can just show it to you how this would look. So we can say something like um, 0.1 lots and we are in a buy position here. We want to have the trailing stop always at the last X um, candles, like at the low of the last X candles. For example, if we would say like the last 10 bars, we would um, go and for example, start here, go back like 10 bars and we will find the lowest point, which would be here. And then the program that we will create in a second would place the stop here. And yeah, for example, if we would have the trade already opened here and if the market would go on and um, we would always place like the uh, stop loss at the last 10 bars at the low. So for example, if we are currently in this bar, we would start dragging this trailing stop um, behind the current uh, price. So we would just drag at the lows of the uh, of the bars and then at some point we would have uh, the stop loss at this um, bar here. Then we would raise it uh, probably here at some time and this is where we would um, get stopped out. So this is like the general idea and we will write the program, the expert advisor that does this completely automated. So let's start right with the programming part. So right now you can see all trade or buy trade has no stop loss and we will have to change this. So to write a program, we will open the IDE, which is the integrated development environment. And you can do so by clicking on IDE or by clicking on tools, MetaQuotes language editor. And this will open the MetaQuotes language editor. And on the left side, you can see the navigator with all the programs. Um, they are uh, they can be found here in this experts folder and um, if you do not see the navigator just click on view navigator and here I can now click on new I say that I want to create a new expert advisor because these are the programs that can take um, trading operations and then I click next I provide a name trailing stop uh, swing high low doesn't really matter what name you choose it but it, I mean it makes sense to choose a name that uh, says something about the functionality of the program. Then we click on next again, next again, and finish. And this will create a brand new expert advisor for you. Brand new expert advisors usually look like this. So they have a lot of gray lines. And these lines are comments for the programmer. So they do not affect the program. And you could um, also delete them because, yeah, again, they do not have any effect on the functionality of the program and this makes the code a little bit shorter and in my opinion uh, easier to to have an overview also i like to rearrange these curly brackets so i always have like the opening curly bracket at um, <clears throat> after the name of a function and the closing curly bracket um, in the beginning pretty much of a new line and yeah, what we have left is three properties and three functions. And I will explain this real quick because um, yeah, it can help us to understand expert advisors in MetaTrader 5. So these properties are just, again, a information for the user of the program. So if you click on compile here, you will find this compile button, uh, button, um, button <laughs> up here and if you click it it will turn your text file pretty much into a executable file and since we are in the metatrader already we can switch back to the metatrader uh, we view the navigator here and here we will have the same expert advisors folder and here we should now file uh, find the compiled trailing stop swing high low file and i can drag and drop it on my chart and here you can see it automatically opens this window with uh, some information, for example, like the name, the version, the copyright, and a link. And this is exactly the information that is um, uh, here in these properties. So if I delete these lines, this is something I can do. 
And if I compile the program again, everything still works. There are no errors. And if I run the program again, the information is just gone. So it's pretty much just a information for the user, but it doesn't change the program at all. So if I click on OK, the program is now already running in the chart. So it is a running program. I mean, it doesn't do anything, but it is already a running program. So let's go back to the meta trader and add some, uh, some functionality. So we have three functions left, and these three functions are automatically triggered if there are certain events in a chart where the expert advisor is attached to. For example, the on init function is triggered when the program is activated or when the time frame is changed, for example. The on dnet function is triggered when the time frame is, or before the time frame is changed. And if the program is um, removed from the chart, for example, we will not use these functions in this program, I think. But yeah, just so you know what these functions do. And the onTick function is the one that we want to use. Because if we add a, uh, a, a simple print statement here, this is a text message like this. Just copy this line. So you write print, which is a system function in the MQL5 framework. So we can use it right away. And then in round brackets after the function call, we um, have a parameter. And in this case, this is a text or string parameter, which is always wrapped between two of these quotation marks. And then we just close the brackets and end the line with a semicolon. And if we compile this, this will now print a text message in the expert journal. And you can see, like you can find this expert journal in the toolbox if you click on experts down here. And you can see this prints, uh, this is a text message really often. And this is printed for every single tick. So whenever there's a price movement, we print this text message. And this is because this uh, print statement is in the on tick function. So when there's a tick in the chart, the on tick function of this EA will automatic, automatically be called. And then we do everything that's inside of this on tick function. And this is why we will put all of our code that is necessary to um, uh, modify the positions and uh, yeah, change the stop loss in the on tick function. Because um, yeah, here we just want to want to make the update, right? And <clears throat> since we want to place um, the stop loss at the low or high of uh, the last x bars, um, we pretty much, when we are starting at the last bar, we only have to do this like once per bar. So the first thing we want to make sure is that we only process the code here, not with every tick, but only once per bar. The easiest way to do so is to create a global variable. This variable is global because it is outside of any function. So it's not in between of these curly brackets, but it's on a global scale pretty much. So here we can say something like bars total. And um, yeah, now this is a bars total variable <laughs> and we can use it. And uh, the difference um, between global variables and local variables that are in the body of a on tick function, for example, um, is that this variable only lives inside of this on tick function. So if this on tick function is processed, like if we are at the end of the on tick function, every variable declared inside of this on tick function will be deleted from the memory of your PC. And this is like the big difference with global variables because global variables are declared and initialized if um, the program is started and they will stay alive and they will stick uh, or stay in your memory of your PC as long as this program is running. So the value inside of this variable will not be deleted as long as this program is running. And this is why we can uh, do something like this. So we will create this local variable and we say we want to store the return value of the ibars function inside of this variable. And this function is again a system variable. And you can always have a look at the reference if you press F1 on your keyboard while your cursor is inside of the function name of every uh, of any function. Also, you can go to help and click on MQL5 reference. And then you can read about this function. For example, this function has two parameters, a symbol parameter and a period parameter. These parameters are used to say what specific chart you want to receive like the amount of candles 
4. So this function returns the amount of candles or bars of a specific chart and it returns this as a integer value. So just a number pretty much. And here we say we want to have the current chart symbol. This is what we get when we say underscore symbol and we say we want to have a, a time frame. For example, we could say period current which would be the current chart time frame. And if we compile this, we now have the total amount of bars stored in this bars variable. So if I print this bars variable, and maybe I can also print the bars total variable to show you what is inside of these two variables. So if you compile this, you will see like the bars variable holds a incredible big number, like 100,000 and something, and the bars total variable holds the value zero. And yeah, this is because we did not change the value in this uh, bars total variable yet. But this is what we will do now. Because now, wait, we can keep this. Now we will check if bars total is not equal bars. And in this case, we want to process a specific piece of code. So let me just um, clear this. Wait, I think I will have to remove the program so you really see what is what's happening. So if I compile the program again now, and if I activate it again in the chart, um, wait, this one, if I click OK, you will see we, wait, this was not <laughs> what I wanted to do. Um, this didn't change anything because I still did not update the bus total variable. But if I do this here, like in the code, I can say something like um, um, bars total bars total is equal to bars. And if I compile this now again, and if I activate the program again, you would see we do not print this message with every single tick again. And also the bars total variable is updated because now we always update the bars total variable if these two values are not equal, which means that we only process everything in between of these curly brackets only once per bar, only if there's a new bar in the chart. And this is what we can use these if statements for. If statements are controlled structures and they help you to like put logic into your code. So you do not have to process the same code with every single tick because here we can check if a condition is true and in this case, this is our condition. So we are checking if the values in the bus total variable and the bus variable are not equal. This is what this operator means. And then we process everything in between of these curly brackets, which is the body of this if statement. But we only do this if this is true. So yeah, this is what an if statement does. So now we can put our code to modify the stop loss in uh, the body of this if statement. Also, a um, little uh, advertisement block here. If you are interested in learning more about MQL5 programming and if you like the way I teach or the approach I, I take here, you can also check out the link below this video. You will find a link to a complete course for uh, MetaTrader 5 programming where I explain everything like from absolute beginner level, you do not need any knowledge um, before you start the course, to a uh, advanced programming level for MetaTrader 5 programs. So if you're interested, check out the link below this video and you will find more information uh, also in a video format what you can expect from this course. But let's go on with our program. Since we figured out how we can manage to process the code only once if there's a new bar, we now have to modify the positions. And to modify open positions um, or all open positions in a specific um, symbol, we cannot only like modify one position because there could be two open positions like this. So we will have to use some kind of loop to check all the open positions. And this is what we usually um, use a for loop for. So a for loop always starts with the keyword for because it's a for loop, obviously. And then in round brackets, um, we have a specific syntax we have to follow. And this is always the same. So we have some kind of like precondition. This piece of code is always executed once if the for loop is initialized. So when the source code or the program reaches line 17, pretty much, in the execution, it will do um, 
the initialization of the for loop. And here we want to initialize or create and initialize a variable. And this is the variable with the name i. And we want to put a value inside of this variable. And it will be the return value of the position's total function. Again, press F1 to read about this function. It returns the number of open positions, pretty simple. So we just get the number of open positions minus one. And we put this value inside of the i variable. So right now we have two open positions. Positions total would return two minus one. So we put one, like the value one, inside of our i variable. This is like what we do when we initialize the for loop. Directly afterwards, we have a condition. So here we check if i is greater greater or equal zero. Yeah, as we said, in this case, i is one, which is greater or equal zero. So we would enter the body of the for loop. And the body of the for loop is again in curly brackets because bodies are always in curly brackets. So we would process, process some something here as soon as we find a or as soon as our condition is true or as long as our condition is true and after we did this we have some kind of uh, process that we do whenever we end the body of a for loop and in this case we want to subtract one from the value that is currently stored inside of i so we can do this operation here this i minus minus is the completely same as writing i minus one. So this is the same as this. This is just a shorter form. That's why you will most likely see something like this if you see a for loop. So what we do here is, again, when we hit or when we reach this for loop in the source code, we create a new variable, we put the value positions total minus one inside of this variable. So in this case, it is one, which is stored inside of i. Then we check if one is greater or equal to zero, which is true, obviously. Then we process stuff. Then we subtract i by one, um, which means that i is now currently, or holds the value zero. Then we check the condition again, which is still true because i is zero, but it's greater or equal to zero. So we process stuff again, and then we subtract um, one from this i value again. Now i is minus one, which is not greater or equal to zero. So we leave the loop and we process whatever comes next. So in this case, we will process this loop for the values i is equal uh, one, and then i is equal zero. And we can now use this value to get, and this is really cool, we can get the position ticket number of positions using this i, because this i can work as an index. So what we can do here is we can say position ticket, and then we say um, position get ticket. This is a predefined function. We can use it right away, and this uh, requests a position ticket index, or position index, and this is i. And if we compile this, this is not throwing any errors. And if we like print the position ticket and maybe also the value i here, you will see that we now um, see in the expert journal like the position tickets and their uh, corresponding um, inde uh, indexes, indices, I don't know. So at zero, we will find like this trade and at index one, we will find this trade. And these are the exact um, position tickets that we print here now. So this is really cool, I think. And if you are wondering what this unsigned long means, this is like an, a, um, a, a variable type, a data type. Unsigned long means, so, so long means it's a really long number. <laughs> I think this is easy to understand. understand. It's something like, it's an integer variable pretty much, which is any number, blah, 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 like this. But if the number is too big, like probably something like this, this would not fit into an integer variable, I think. But it would fit into a long variable because long, the long data type can hold even bigger numbers. And the u, or unsigned, just means that this value cannot be negative. This would not be okay in an unsigned long variable, but this would be okay.
So this is what the long variable is. Again, you can read about this. If you click F1 on your keyboard, you can read about like variable data types, I think, here. And yeah. Mm, so now since we have the position ticket, we can select a position using this position ticket. And the easiest way is to use position get or select. Oh, and <laughs> select by ticket. And by the way, um, um, this step is pretty much optional. So you do not have to do this. Uh, someone commented this before um, because the position get ticket function already selects the, the position. So this step is not like really needed. Um, I kind of still do this really often because it uh, helps me to structure my code and to see that the position is now selected. And this is something you do in MetaTrader 4. So I kind of took this from MetaTrader 4 programming to MetaTrader 5 programming. But yeah, again, this uh, step is pretty much optional. But now we selected a position and now we have access to the position properties. And this is really cool because now we can get, for example, um, the, the position stop loss. So we can get the position stop loss and we can store it in a double variable. Double variables is the data, data type for um, values that have a decimal point. So, so these values would be double values because they have a decimal point. You cannot store these values in a integer or long data type. Um, so we need a double for this. And now we can use the position get double function. Again, this is like violet, so it means it's a system function. You can read about it in the documentation here in the reference. And this will just give you access to any position property. So you will find a link here to a enumeration. If I click this, you can see all the like properties that you can choose. And we will choose this identifier position underscore sl. So we can just write in these brackets here after the function call position SL like this. And this will now give us the position SL. Also, we will need the position stop loss position, uh, sorry, TP. So now we have the position stop loss and position TP stored in these two variables. We will need this later on. But first of all, we will have to calculate the new SL because yeah, obviously we want to modify our position. So what we do next is we check if we currently see a buy position or a sell position, because for buy positions, we want to have like the low of the last 10 bars and for sell positions, we want the high of the last 10 bars, right? So what we do here is we check whoop, uh, if position get integer now, position, position, type is equal to position type by. In this case, it is a by position. Also, we can concatenate multiple if statements by using an else if structure. So we can say position, wait, uh, else if position get integer. So we can also check if the position type is position type sell if it is not a position type by uh, type. So this means it is a buy position. This means it is a sell position. So now we can go ahead and calculate the stop loss. So what we do first is we will find the index of the lowest low pretty much. So we can do this um, by using, by, first of all, we create a variable where we want to store the value uh, like inside of this variable. And then we use the I lowest function. This is again, system function. You can read about this in the documentation. It returns the index of the smallest value found in a specific chart. So we have, first of all, have to define what chart we want to look um, for a lowest low. So we say symbol and period current, which is again, the current chart pretty much. Then we say mode low because we are searching for low prices and then we can define in what specific range we are searching for these values. So we will say for example the last 10 bars so our count, count will be 10 and then we have to define a starting value. I want to choose one here and what this does is it will now search starting at position one which is the last bar always in the chart and then it will take 10 bars. So in between of these 10 bars, this function would search for the lowest low and it would return the index. So in this case, it would return three. 
because the index of the lowest bar is 3. Or no, it is, uh, wait, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. It is 4 because um, the, uh, the, the, the indexes always start at the latest bar in the chart. So now we have the index of the lowest bar. What we now need is the low of this bar. This is really easy because we can use the ilow function for this. And we just define our chart again, the current chart. And now this shift value is requested. And since we have the shift value stored in the variable here, we can just use it. So now we will have the low of the last x bars. And what we can do now is we can check. Oh, there's one step we should still do. We can round this value because sometimes you will have some rounding issues with uh, values uh, if you program. This is pretty common for a lot of programming languages. So it's always a good idea to round your prices. So what we do now is we check if this low is greater than the last stop loss uh, or the current stop loss of the uh, of the of the um, trade and if this is true we we then want to modify the stop loss and uh, whenever we um um yeah we can delete this comment whenever we want to modify positions the easiest way is to use a class that is also predefined in the mql5 framework and you can use this class by including a specific file. And you can do so by writing this hashtag include and then in these spiky brackets here, uh, which is just a smaller and greater than uh, operator, you can write this path. And if you compile this, it will, you can see it here in the toolbox, it will include a lot of files. And this file can be found in the include folder here in your navigator if you go to trade, trade.mqh. So, so this is the file that we are including here. Again, if you want to learn more about this, check out the complete course below this video. You will find a link and I explain everything in detail there. But uh, for this tutorial, it's just important that we can now use the Ctrade class, which is defined in this file to modify our positions. And you can do this by creating an object variable like Ctrade, trade, like this. This will create a variable which is named trade of type C trade and we can use this to modify our positions. So we can do something like trade position modify and this is a function uh, that we can use to modify open positions. It has three function parameters. The first one is the ticket of the position you want to modify. So we will provide our position ticket variable from here. Then it requests a stop loss. And here we choose the low because we want to put the stop loss at the low here. Also, it requests a take profit. And since we do not want to change the take profit, we just choose the position take profit from the position that we currently selected. So now closing some brackets and in the body of this if statement, which we will reach if this operation was successful, we can print something like, um, we can say position number, position ticket was modified. So we know that this expert advisor modified the position. So now you can see again, um, wait, let me uh, remove the program from the chart so we can see what happens if I activate it. Um, and if I compile the program again, this will already modify the positions of the uh, the current open positions because these are buy positions and we already um, added the code for the buy side. So we activate the trading stop swing high low program here. Click on OK. Have a look here. The stop loss for both of these trades is now at the low of the last 10 bars, which is at this level here. And you can also see in the expert journal, we find a um, text message that says, yeah, what the program does pretty much. So this is really cool. But if we had a um, sell position here, um, nothing happens for the sell position because um, yeah, this the code is just not added for sell positions. So what we do here is um, um, we pretty much we can copy this complete block and just paste it here where we process the sell positions, right? So just paste it here, and now we have to do some adjustments. So first of all, we do not have the we do not want the shift value of the lowest bar of the last ten bars, but of the highest. 
So instead of I lowest, just write I highest. Um, this is another function which works completely the same pretty much, just like for, for high values, not for low values. And then we say, of course, mode high, because we want like the highest value of the high prices of the last 10 bars. And then, of course, we do not receive the low, but the high. So we just write instead of I low, I high, the rest stays the same. And then we round this high value and not the low value, of course. Once we did this, we have to check if this high is, uh, wait, smaller than the position stop loss of the cell position. And if this is true, then we want to modify the position and this can stay completely the same. So uh, once we did all this, we can compile. Wait, there's still one problem. Oh, we, of course, the new SL is not the low, but the high. So if we compile this, we see nothing happens. And the problem is, um, if you do not have ASL, the value for the position to stop loss is zero. So with this in mind, we can check this condition. So is, a, is our high price smaller than zero? I don't think so. So for sell positions, you always have to check if the current position step, uh, stop loss is zero. And if we add this code and compile it, um, you can see now, the stop loss for cell positions is also modified. So let me show you one more thing. For example, if I open another cell position, um, nothing happens. And this is because uh, the pro program processes the code only once per bar. So this stop loss would be changed if there's a new bar. And if you want to have this stop loss modified with the next tick, you can just like delete this part of the code. So if I delete this and um, yeah, I like to like rearrange the code. So, so let me put this to the left side using the tabulator. I also have to delete this because this was the closing bracket for the if statement. But if I write my code like this now, like without the wrapping if statement that checks if there's a new bar, I can compile this and you can see now whenever I press, uh, I open a new buy position or sell position, it automatically um, puts the stop loss with the next tick. So this is pretty much how you can write a simple program that processes or changes um, the stop loss for your trades and puts the stop loss at the high or low of the last X bars. So let me show you the code one more time. So you can copy everything. And I hope you were able to learn something in this tutorial. This was a really easy basic tutorial. And yeah, if you want to learn more, check out the link below this video. But here we just, um, yeah, like, uh, wait, let me make this gone. So we just uh, used a for loop to loop through all the open positions. Oh, and also like, by the way, now we do not need this anymore because we... Yeah, just removed uh, like the the part of the code where we needed this global variable. So here we just have a for loop to loop through all the positions. We then find the position ticket. We select a position. Then we receive some of the position properties using the position get double function. Then we check if the position type is position type buy, which means it's a buy position, or if it is a sell position. And, um, oh yeah, by the way, if you are using like if and else if um, control structures, it makes sense to like put everything that is in the body of a if statement a little bit to the right. And you can do this by like highlighting your code and then using the tabulator. And if you um, like press like uh, shift on your uh, keyboard and press the tabulator, you can move everything to the, to the, to the other side, to the left side. And yeah, and then we just check for a buy position. Uh, we calculate like the lowest point, the lowest low of the last 10 bars. And we calculate this level and we round it. And then we check if this is uh, like greater or above the uh, position stop loss that we currently have. And if this is true, we modify the position. And therefore, we need this like a C trade class. And uh, you will have to add this line at the top of your code. Otherwise, you cannot use this C trade class. And yeah, we do the same pretty much for a cell position. So this is it for this uh, short programming tutorial. Let me know if you liked it in the comment section. And again, if you have more suggestions for videos, for programming tutorials, let me know in the comment section below. This is it for this tutorial. Hope you can use the program. And as always, have a great time and good trades. Bye-bye.